<laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Bruce Kuklick, who is the Nichols Professor of American History Emeritus at the University of Pennsylvania and a member of the American Philosophical Society. He is the author of a dozen books on such things as diplomatic, political, intellectual, and cultural history uh, of the United States. Uh, he and Emmanuel Girard uh, of the KUL Leuven in Belgium uh, have co-authored the book Death in the Congo, Murdering Patrice Lumumba, which has recently been published by Hartford University Press uh, and which is available outside of those doors afterwards uh, when we have finished. Bruce. Uh, after some negotiation, I'm going to uh, stand up because I can't talk sitting down. Uh, and uh, I have this, uh, I don't know what you call it, mic that I'm going to be using. Uh, so I hope it works for all of you. Uh, in the early part of 1960, Belgium uh, hurriedly relinquished control of its huge Central African colony, the Belgian Congo, uh, to the first democratically elected government. It was led by Patrice Lumumba, the prime minister, who was a talented and charismatic African nationalist. Uh, his government almost immediately collapsed. His army, mutiny, his army mutinied in the distant southeast of the Congo, the most uh, important province, Katanga, seceded. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Belgians sent uh, soldiers into the Congo, at least initially, with some justification to protect Belgian nationals. Uh, the UN responded with a, a peacekeeping force, which uh, ultimately numbered some 20,000 people, uh, 20,000 soldiers from a variety of mostly African, black African nations. Uh, seemingly from afar, the United States uh, worried about the influence of communism in Africa and at least instability in the Congo. And then, six months after independence, uh, Lumumba himself was murdered in Katanga province. Something about the trajectory of this guy's career and the manner of his passing has persistently attracted attention for well over 50 years now. And not just scholarly attention, although there's been a lot of that, uh, but also, in addition, the, the attention of a, a global educated uh, community, ordinary people everywhere. Uh, I taught for many years at the University of Pennsylvania, and Penn has a scholarly and teaching exchange with the Catholica Universität Leuven, formerly Louvain, uh, a Belgian university which itself has deep ties to the Congo. And almost 20 years ago, 20 years ago now, uh, I taught in Belgium on the exchange, and immediately succeeding that, my now co-author, Emmanuel Girard, came to Philly to, uh, uh, to teach. And, and the joint teaching we did established a friendship between us. And then in uh, 2000 and 2001, Girard was asked to chair the committee of experts that the Belgian parliament had employed to help conduct Belgium's investigation, own investigation uh, of, the, of the killing. This was a very intensive investigation, uh, I did a although it uh, primarily uh, was related to Belgium. I did a little research at that time for Girard in the United States. And by 2002, 2003, he was sitting on a huge government report. His primary language was Flemish. Uh, it was um, written in what he called parliamentary ease, although he was the principal author of it. it contained hundreds of pages of primary, uh, primarily undigested uh, original materials. And we thought for a long time about what, what, what might be done with this material. Uh, the result is, uh, is the book, uh, our book that I'm talking about today. Now, in telling you about the book, I have one uh, presupposition in mind. Over the years, I've been down here several times to the, um, to the NHC, and I try to keep up, at least to some extent, with what you're doing, and I can't help but notice that there uh, is an awful lot of work on colonialism, post-colonialism, uh, Africa and the Congo in particular. 
and seeing you all here, I realize there are a lot of people who are uh, responsible for nudging uh, the NHC in that direction. But uh, I want to talk about one for a second, Steve Weissman over there. Uh, Steve, as you know, is the preeminent authority on the politics of the Congo in this period. Uh, and if you look at the book, you'll see that uh, that he uh, is primus inter pares of the people we thank. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to come down here today was to thank Steve publicly for his help. And I do, Steve Weisman. Um, and my, the presupposition guiding me is that you will have been nudged in certain directions by Steve. Uh, and I've tailored this talk to kind of take up some of, the, some of the, the issues that he might have predisposed you to think about. But I'm more than happy to talk about anything you want to talk about uh, related to uh, the Lumumba affair. What the book does uh, is to look at uh, the murder of Lumumba as a process that involves four groups of people. Uh, the UN, uh, the Belgians, the anti-Lumumba Africans, and the United States. And what I want to do is sketch very briefly the role of the first three groups, the UN, the Belgians, and the anti-Lumumba Africans, and then focus more on the United States. Uh, a lot of people, including us, uh, have noted that the UN in the Congo was not impartial, that it was, in fact, uh, predisposed against Lumumba. This is something we underscore and underline over and over again. Right from the start, uh, uh, Dag Hammarskjöld, the famous uh, Secretary General of the UN, uh, is really hostile uh, to Lumumba. And indeed, what we argue in the book that is that the principal series of events that dislodges Lumumba from the premiership and underlines legitimate governance in the Congo occurs when in early September the UN undertakes uh, a series of activities which don't exactly remove Lumumba from the prime ministership but certainly send the Congo into, a, into chaos if your criterion uh, for stability is some kind of legitimate form of government governance. Now, it is not news that the words of statesmen often do not hook up in any clear way with what they do. That is, there's a big gap between, uh, between what uh, international politicians say and what they do. That's not news. Uh, what is noteworthy about the UN in the Congo is that uh, the UN has been specifically designed not to speak to uh, the interests of nation states, but somehow to rise above these competing interests and, uh, and uh, embody the, the international norms of humanity. And certainly, over and over again, Hammerskold uses that series of conceptions to justify his activities in the Congo. At the same time, his, um, his actions depart so extraordinarily from his, uh, uh, his expressed views that the, they really uh, strike, strike one immediately. Uh, we don't call it hypocrisy in the book because it's so enormous there's such an enormous gap that hypocrisy doesn't really get to it at all. So that's the UN. Second uh, group of players uh, actually, if from, from my mind, is much more interesting, and that is the, uh, the Belgian politicians. Uh, the Belgian government uh, in 1960, the elected parliamentarians are weak, but they have committed themselves to giving independence to the Congo, they do so. And they're also committed, however uh, grudgingly, uh, to see to it that the Congo becomes an independent state among the newly independent nations in Africa, and indeed uh, becomes a, a player on the world stage. This attitude of the elected politicians infuriates Baudouin, king of the Belgians. 
And unlike other monarchs in Europe, in Britain, uh, in the Scandinavian <coughs> countries, and in the Netherlands, the Belgian king has real clout. And to make uh, a uh, complicated and long story very short, Baldwin undertakes what the American observers, American diplomats called a royalist coup d'etat. He attempts, the king, uh, to get rid of uh, the elected government in the Congo, or sorry, the elected government in Brussels, in Belgium, which he considers to be much too favorably disposed to Lumumba. And the king wants to replace this government by what was called a government of strongmen, a government of affairs, a government of men who would operate behind the curtain. Now the king <coughs> fails in this attempt at a coup d'etat of overthrowing constitutional democracy in Belgium in 1960. He does, however, scare the bejesus out of the politicians. And in response to what he does, you see the Belgian government moving to the right, taking a much more uh, pro-colonial stand, a, a much more reactionary position in regard to uh, politics in the Congo. Uh, Baldwin, the king, loses the war. Belgium remains democratic, uh, but he wins the battle. The, the policies become more oriented to what he would like. To put it in the way that we find most compelling, uh, the Belgian politicians, in order to preserve democracy at home, jettison it <coughs> in the Congo. They preserve constitutional democracy in Europe. They let it go in Africa. Third group, um, the anti-Lumumba Africans. Everybody who has written about this doffs his or her cap to the autonomy of the Africans but they don't give it to them. Over and over again, you see that the people who are opposed to Lumumba are stooges of the West, or at, uh, at best, automatons who do the bidding of whatever uh, white advisor they've seen last. On the contrary, we give these people what historians now call, who are not emeritus, what historians call their agency. Uh, <laughs> These people knew the regions of the Congo that they represented far better than the whites. They quickly developed a political style which enraged, infuriated, baffled the whites. Uh, they had their own ideas about uh, what they wanted to see happen in their, the portions of Africa that they controlled. Uh, they had clearly defined interests which weren't those of Western nationalists, nor were they, those the interests of Lumumba's nationalism. And they acted on their interests. They did not do what the whites wanted all the time. Uh, indeed, after the UN dislodges uh, Lumumba, it's, it's Lumumba's opponents who are most active and effective uh, in getting him killed. They, uh, they uh, secure his uh, house imprisonment around the prime minister's uh, mansion. Uh, they, uh, they operate in such a way that he is finally put into a real jail uh, in, the, uh, in the western part of the Congo, and then they arrange a complicated transfer by where, whereby the guy gets uh, taken to, Lumum, uh, to uh, Katanga, where his most vicious opponents uh, kill him. So they're the three, uh, three players of, of greater importance than they are uh, that I'm telling you because I want to focus now on the last uh, group of people, uh, the American policy makers. And here, um, it's conventional, but I think nonetheless uh, largely true, that Eisenhower in the 1950s, when he was president, uh, looks for what was called a third way uh, in foreign policy between uh, the bombastic rhetoric of John Foster Dulles in the State Department uh, and, the, and the thermonuclear war offered up uh, to Eisenhower by the military. Now it's quite clear that, uh, that right from the start Eisenhower develops more nuanced alternatives uh, 
to military strategy than thermonuclear war. But he's very suspicious of military options. And very soon, the third way, for, the middle way for him becomes the, the work of the CIA under Foster Dulles's younger brother, Alan Dulles. Uh, Alan Dulles, uh, through covert operations, uh, can operate behind the scenes, solve problems in American foreign policy, uh, and ward off some titanic public confrontation between the United States and the Soviet <laughs> Union during these perilous days of the Cold War. Uh, so for a lot of people, or for some people in Washington, Dulles becomes the go-to person in foreign policy. That's for some people. A lot of other people in Washington are suspicious of the CIA and uh, what it does. Uh, some of this is uh, turf war, that is people in various agencies being worried that Dulles is ta the CIA is taking over uh, areas of uh, foreign policy making that should belong to some other agency. But there are a number of conservative, uh, tough-minded uh, Republican foreign policy operatives who have more serious reservations about the Central Intelligence Agency. And there's so much serious criticism that Eisenhower employs throughout uh, the mid uh, uh, the early mid-50s up to the, the end of his administration, uh, a, a series of boards of review of committees, commissions who investigate the CIA. The most important one is called the Board of Consultants on Foreign Intelligence Operations. And uh, the board, uh, from 1954 on, repeatedly makes very serious uh, critical reports on the CIA. Uh, they say, for example, that the CIA does not do at least one of the jobs it set out to do. It doesn't provide intelligence. They also complain that the agency spends hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars without much oversight. And they, uh, and they attribute this to the fact that Alan Dulles is just a terrible uh, manager, a terrible bureaucrat. Uh, more pointedly, the crux of their uh, complaint is that we have no idea in the operations of the CIA what, uh, what, pr what criteria are in place which will trigger a, C a covert operation. We have no idea of what criteria uh, are in place to tell us that a certain covert operation has been successful or not. And we don't have any way of judging whether what the CIA has accomplished could be accomplished in a more effective way, or in a way that is cheaper, or in a way that is less dangerous to the prestige of the United States, or in a way that doesn't have serious negative consequences for other aspects of American foreign policy. Uh, Dulles, uh, after each one of these reports, promises reforms and doesn't make them. I think the main re I, well, maybe he couldn't make reforms, uh, even if he tried, but one reason he doesn't is that Eisenhower generally supports him. More important, in day-to-day -day operations, the, uh, uh, the State Department under Foster Dulles protects him. And I think the fact that he's uh, Foster Dulles' brother means that Alan, uh, Alan's uh, work uh, gets uh, is generally uh, constructed within the boundaries of what passes for reasonable foreign policy in the United States in the 1950s. <laughs> well, I, I who laughed there. I didn't mean that. To, let me reset. I don't. I don't mean. Okay. I don't mean to be. <coughs> what this means is that Alan Dulles is guided into a responsible path of foreign fo policy making by his brother. In 1959, big brother John Foster Dulles dies, a new group takes over in the State Department, uh, <laughs> and the number of reports by the Board of Consultants and the severity of the reports increases. The last one comes across Eisenhower's desk 
in, uh, at the end of 1960, end of 1961. It demands immediate reforms by Dulles. Uh, it's, it's takes issue with a number of current covert operations. And as I read the report, it says if, if something doesn't happen at once, Dulles should be separated from the CIA, Alan Dulles. Uh, Eisenhower takes this report. It's, it's there on his desk at the beginning of January 1961, passes it on to his successor, Jack Kennedy, uh, uh, who takes over a few weeks later. Back in 1959, after Foster Dulles dies, Allen is eager, if not desperate, to show himself uh, a responsible member of Eisenhower's foreign policy team. He has a vested interest in looking at uh, problems in American foreign policy that only can be solved by the work of the CIA. And right from the start of the, uh, of the problems in the Congo, you see Alan Dulles again and again and again pushing uh, the administration uh, to uh, in, involve itself in covert operations to somehow bring down the Lumumba regime or to, to move it off the political stage. Eisenhower resists for uh, a good six, seven, even eight weeks into the Congo crisis. He does not give Dulles the green light. And there are two patterns of reasoning which shapes uh, Eisenhower's refusal. On the one hand, Eisenhower doesn't know anything about the Congo. He doesn't care about Africa. This is not a front line in the Cold War. It is a secondary or tertiary priority. And to the extent that he wants to pay much attention to it at all, he can do so through the work of the UN. Right away, he uh, has an understanding with Hammerskold uh, and the United Nations that that organization will control, uh, constrain, corral Lumumba, uh, and if necessary, kind of ease him out of the Congo's politics. If there has to be fighting, it can be done by African soldiers led by the UN. The United States doesn't have to involve itself in this issue. On the other hand, um, Eisenhower does have a priority in the Cold War, uh, and that priority is in Central Europe, in Germany, uh, where there has been a long series standing of a, sta a long series of confrontations between Russia and the United States, especially over uh, uh, West, the problem of West Berlin. West Berlin has been uh, an issue in East-West relations from the late 1940s on with the Berlin airlift. There was a, uh, a crisis in 54, there's another one in 58, there's another one in April of 61, just as Eisenhower is going out of office. Uh, and here, Eisenhower feels he has to have all his ducks in a row. And his ducks consist of the members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. NATO is Eisenhower's brainchild. He is one of the uh, originators uh, of the whole idea. He was the first military <laughs> commander in NATO, and he sees NATO as the linchpin uh, of uh, a ultimately a social, political, and economic alliance that's going to carry civilization into the 21st century. Here is where Eisenhower wants to put, uh, put his uh, resources. And he happens to have uh, a very strong ally in, uh, in this undertaking, the uh, Secretary General uh, of NATO, the civilian head of NATO, a guy named Paul Henri Spock. Uh, Spock actually was a Belgian politician, uh, uh, important in the 1930s and 40s, and then in the 1950s he becomes an international civil servant. He is an old friend of Eisenhower's from World War II. He is the most articulate European proponent uh, of this notion of uh, an Atlanticist bloc uh, that will lead civilization. And from 1957 on he becomes uh, uh, the civilian head of NATO. So with NATO, his focus on the one hand and, uh, and the idea that the UN can handle Lumumba in the Congo, Eisenhower doesn't give Dulles the green light that Dulles wants. Then 
I'm going to say the first or second week of August, Eisenhower changes his mind and Dulles gets what he wants. Uh, and the same patterns of reasoning uh, with, uh, in Eisenhower uh, occur in his giving permission to Dulles. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Lumumba uh, in uh, the Congo keeps blustering that he's going to throw out the UN. Now, will he do that? From the American point of view, this guy is labile, irresponsible, we can't trust him. Even if he doesn't throw the UN out, uh, he, the, the very notion of his complaining all the time, Lumumba's not stupid. He knows the UN <laughs> is opposed to him. Even if he doesn't throw the UN out, uh, the very uh, series of complaints creates stability, if not something worse. Uh, in the Congo itself. So Eisenhower's uh, reliance on his UN strategy uh, is crumbling as uh, Lumumba becomes more uh, irritated in his expressions of uh, hostility to the, to the presence of the UN. On the other hand, Eisenhower has a big defection uh, in NATO. Turns out Paul Henri Spock although he is a liberal internationalist when it comes to Western European affairs, is a reactionary in respect to Belgium, Belgium and the Congo. Indeed, he is one of the guys whom Baldwin, King of the Belgians, wants to bring back into Belgian politics and participate in what I've called a royal, or what the American diplomats call a royalist coup d'etat. That is to say, uh, Baldwin attempts to negotiate with Spock to get Spock to come in and be prime minister of, a country, uh, of, of uh, Belgium, even though he's not a member of parliament, even though he's not an elected politician at that time. Uh, Spock, it turns out, is furious at his old friend Eisenhower because he regards Eisenhower's reliance on the UN uh, to be weak-kneed, soft in respect to the Congo. And uh, in the first week of August, uh, at NATO headquarters, Spock writes a furious personal letter to President Eisenhower, in which he says, I'm quitting NATO, and more than that, this organization is no good, it's not working. Uh, can't be trusted, it's a failure. Now, as these matters go, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, Spock does resign from NATO over these issues, but it takes him five months to do so. In addition to that, he is dissuaded from sending this letter to Eisenhower. We have the letter, uh, but he doesn't send it. He instead discusses it with the American ambassador to NATO uh, and discusses his feelings. Uh, the next day, that letter is delivered by the CIA and arrives at Eisenhower's desk in the uh, Oval Office. And given the fact that his UN strategy is collapsing, and in addition that NATO might collapse, Eisenhower gives the green light to Alan Dulles. Uh, and then, in a very famous national security meeting of August 18th, about, I think about a week later, um, after uh, uh, Dulles gets to go ahead, Eisenhower, in a very uh, irritated mood, uh, tells the National Security Council and, and the CIA, uh, he directs it, the agency to kill Lumumba. Now we've looked, a lot, a lot of other people have looked at this material as we have, and I think uh, we're correct in believing that Eisenhower did give this order, uh, but we're part of, a, I think, a, a wider consensus in believing that. So there are two steps to the United States getting involved. The first step involves the, uh, uh, the green light to covert operations, and then maybe a week to ten days later, Eisenhower mandates that also that the CIA should, should uh, kill Lumumba in the Congo. Now what happens after that is unclear. And I want to tell you what we think, and then I want to tell you why I think what, what we think is contestable and debatable. Also very interesting. There are divided councils uh, in, the, uh, in the CIA. 
Uh, there's some people who are happy to go along with uh, assassination. Uh, uh, one of them, for example, is Richard Bissell, who's generally regarded as the number two guy in the CIA at that time. Another guy who's happy to go along with assassination is Larry Devlin, uh, the famous chief of station in the Congo. Uh, at the same time, uh, the guy they send over there to oversee the murder operation has made it clear before he, he left, the, uh, left the United States that he doesn't want to have anything to do with assassination. He's opposed to it. And when, indeed, when he gets to the Congo, he doesn't do his job. He's, he winds up uh, drinking in uh, the capital's famous bars. Um, <laughs> another guy whom we feel is not uh, particularly happy with the order to assassinate is Alan Dulles himself. Uh, Dulles is a guy who loves uh, the romance of spying, but uh, we think that uh, uh, he doesn't want to get involved in assassination. In any event, because of these divided councils, the, uh, the CIA operations in the Congo, we feel, do not amount to much. Uh, uh, they get involved in uh, attempted murder uh, and, uh, and don't do uh, anything that comes near to killing Lumumba. In addition to that, uh, we would also argue that the covert operations that the United States engages in, uh, which antedate the decision to murder Lumumba, that those covert operations don't do very much to uh, bring Lumumba down. As I said before, uh, the main actors in bringing his government to an end uh, are people in the UN, and then prior, and then the second group would be the Belgians. Uh, overall, what the UN, what the CIA does in the Congo in the last six months of 1960 uh, is not very effective or efficient. These guys are certainly malintentioned in respect to Lumumba, but they aren't very competent. Uh, and I guess one thing I, one thing that Gerard and I both think uh, is that one of the problems with the uh, English language scholarship on the Lumumba affair is that it's been so focused on the United States role that, it, uh, that it's very easy not just to blow up the role of the CIA, but because every scholar I know hates the CIA, they, they tend to magnify their, the evil genius of the agency. We feel that Larry Devlin was, this was his first big job, and that he didn't do very well at it, at least for the first six months. Now, that's what we think happened. Why is our vision debatable? Why are there other, uh, why are there other concerns that, uh, uh, that can be brought to bear on the problem. Uh, the problem is not just that it's very difficult extracting documents from the CIA. We all know, at least any of you who worked with the CIA know that. Uh, my friend Richard Immerman, I, and who's just written a book on the CIA, if you look at it, the book has some of those great big heavy black marks uh, on the documents he used. Um, they're, the people are impossible, but it's not just that. It's rather that the chief informant here for everything that happens from the point of view of the Americans is Larry Devlin. And the problem with this guy who is the chief of uh, station in the Congo, uh, the problem is multiple. <clears throat> if you look at uh, 1960 and 61, when Lumumba is bumped off, there's an awful lot of outrage all over the world. But uh, there are a lot of people in Western political capitals who are happy to see him go. Maybe it's too bad that he had to be killed, murdered in this horrible way that he was, but this guy was a problem, let's move on. Uh, throughout this, this early period, uh, Devlin, from the tiny bit of information we have, never never uh, does anything but bask in the general light that he is the mastermind of all this. He might not have done it himself, but he certainly was in the background pulling the strings, the puppeteer. If you look at the first generation of CIA tell-all memoirs, 
they all allude to this guy in Central Africa who was, you know, really knew what he was doing in getting rid of, rid of Lumumba. Now fast forward 15 years to 1975. It's the end of uh, the Vietnam War. It's the time of the resignation of Richard Nixon because of the scandals. Uh, and the rise of the Church Committee, the Senate Committee, which uh, is investigating all of these uh, nasty things that uh, the executive branch in the United States has done for the past 15 years. Now, it's not so good to be uh, tainted by the notion that you participated in, the assass in an assassination. And Devlin is one of the chief people who testified before the, uh, the church <coughs> committee. And now the story dramatically changes. Uh, Devlin was okay with uh, covert operations, but uh, he thought it was imprudent and unethical uh, for the United States to be involved in political assassination. And even though he was a young, starting out uh, chief of station, he did everything he could to subvert the orders of his superiors, Eisenhower and Dulles. Uh, and he, all, he engaged in, from his, his telling, all sorts of uh, bureaucratic foot dragging to avoid implementing the orders he had gotten from Washington, D.C. What you get in, in this telling is a tale of moral courage by Devlin about how he was uh, determined uh, to, to prevent the United States from getting into the business of assassination. Now, fast forward another 15 years. Uh, this is the period of American Cold War triumphalism, when all these officials are going around beating their breasts about how they were instrumental in defeating uh, the nefarious Soviet enemy. Uh, this is a period when uh, Devlin makes a number of public appearances talking about what he was doing and actually writes his autobiography. And now the story changes again. Uh, yes, he did show moral courage, but what really is important is that from the early part of 1960 onwards, he saw the possibilities of Joseph Mobutu being uh, an adequate replacement for Lumumba. M Mobutu, as you know, became uh, the authoritarian leader of the Congo by the mid-1960s and stayed in power for some 30 years. Devlin uh, says he recognizes he recognized this steel in Mobutu uh, and uh, helps place him in power very quickly and then he tries to, and then is, is the force behind the throne to keep Obutu in power. Uh, now, what's going on here with Devlin? First of all, one of the things that we learned in writing this book is you can't trust people's memories as a transparent source about the past. It's very, very difficult. People's uh, ideas change, they respond to current events, they respond to questions put to them. Uh, I always would rather have a document than oral testimony. Uh, although oral testimony is you know, very, sometimes very, very important. The more, uh, so that's one thing. Second thing is Devlin is a careerist, an opportunist. He's looking for ways to make his career in the CIA. And he shifts his views as he goes along to embody what he thinks will be those traits uh, and those abilities which will promote him most uh, within the CIA. Uh, finally, Devlin's also a member, is a CIA agent. His job is not to tell us the truth. His job is to kick up a dust and say, we can't see anything. His job is to obfuscate, uh, to lie if necessary. So all of these things go, go into attempting to understand uh, the trajectory of the stories that Devlin uh, is telling doesn't mean they're false. What it means is that you have to construe uh, the, these matters and not assume at all that what is being said is transparent or coherent. Uh, and because of these issues, which I have to tell you that Manu and I struggled with for months and even years, uh, the story that 
we will stand by and believe to be true is one that's contestable because this evidence is so obscure in some ways. All right, let me conclude by talking about how we parse the responsibilities of, uh, of the people who did Lumumba in. Uh, we use here uh, an analogy drawn from Agatha Christie's murder mystery, Murder on the Orient Express. In that uh, crime novel, uh, Christie's detective, Hercule Poirot, is called upon to figure out who killed this very nasty man who's been stabbed to death in his compartment on the train. Uh, Poirot has a dozen suspects. He finally concludes that all of them did it. Uh, they drugged the guy in his compartment on the train, and they passed a dagger from one to another, each one stabbing him. Not even the 12 who did it know who's responsible. They're all collectively responsible. And so we argue, we can give you the names of the 20 people in the UN, in Belgium, uh, among the anti-Lumumba Africans, and uh, the US, who are jointly responsible for uh, Lumumba's death. Now, being responsible for a death does not mean you are guilty of anything. For you to be guilty, you have to be, there has to be a crime committed. In the, in the detective novel, very interestingly, Poirot sends the 12 people away. Uh, I really have to tell you I dislike that. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, just what I'm telling you, the, the, the climax. <laughs> uh, being responsible doesn't mean you're guilty. Uh, to be guilty, there has to be a crime committed. There has to be criminal culpability. Uh, uh, there, there has to be uh, metrics of punishment, all sorts of things like that. In the novel, the, the dozen people who killed this guy go free. It's considered justifiable homicide. Now, I'm not saying that is true in the Lumumba murder. Uh, it's much more difficult and complex. Uh, we, we do believe that the notions of criminal responsibility, guilt, are much more applicable in, uh, in, national, in areas where there na there's national sovereignty, where you have a court system, where you have uh, people select it and who have authority to, uh, uh, to judge, uh, to allocate their procedures to determine guilt and innocence, and there's uh, uh, punishments available. Those notions have much less applicability in the anarchic world of international politics. Now, the standard reply to that is that this might have been true 500 years ago, but now we have uh, universal norms in place, we have a, a pretty firm concept of international law, and we even have uh, uh, an organization, the UN, which is able to be the bearer of these transnational uh, principles and ideas. That might be true, but in 1960, when all, in 61, when all this is happening, as I've tried to suggest, the UN has dishonored itself as a, an instrumentality of international law and of the embodiment of universal norms. So to the extent that using the UN as a way of, uh, of saying there has to be something w wrong and punishable, it doesn't work for that period of time because Hammerskull doesn't, uh, doesn't have in our eyes uh, that kind, the, the kind of credibility to uh, to embody those transnational norms. Now that's still not to say that, uh, that these guys were not criminally guilty of, uh, of doing something. But we end the book by saying this is a very, very serious and deep moral and political question which we leave to our readers to come to a conclusion about. And, um, I'm going to leave uh, my auditors today with that to think about. Thank you. I don't know what the, what's the... I will call you. Okay. And I can sit down. You may. But take this with you. Oh, no, that's you better than that.
All right, I'm going to guess we have some things to say. Um, we have some ground rules, uh, the first uh, of which is please wait until the microphone reaches you before you start to speak, and please identify yourself um, before your comment. We've got a, a hand right here, this table here. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, my name's Alex Van Oss. Uh, at the time of these events, I was uh, a little boy living in Uganda. My father was the uh, consul general in Kampala, and he knew these people you talked about in the uh, Belgian, former Belgian Congo. <coughs> decades later, decades later, I learned that an old family friend of ours named Bronson Tweedy uh, was in the CIA had a Afrin, if that and had a CIA. hand in the... Uh, a poisoned toothpaste episode. I didn't get a chance to ask him much about it, but I'm wondering if you can shed light on his role in all this. Um, Tweedy was kind of the middleman. Tweedy was kind of the middleman. He would get his instructions from Richard Bissell and Alan Dulles, and he would often be the guy who would convey them to uh, these instructions to Larry Devlin in the Congo. We really have uh, one extraordinary message which uh, Tweedy sa sends to uh, Devlin uh, in which he describes the hitmen they are sending to the Congo uh, and who is is this guy Tweedy a friend of yours he's a jerk that's what I will say he was an old family friend. Okay. Uh, uh, but if you uh, if you look at the church committee here, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the publication, the interim report of the church committee, it quotes in full the, the couple of paragraphs from Tre Tweedy's instructions to Devlin, which are just chilling in the way the the uh, CIA thought about uh, what it was doing, or at least members of the CIA thought. Right up here. Um. Uh, David Throop from uh, George Washington University in the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, we have a tendency to, to see Lumumba as a great hero. Um, and I'm wondering if that is not fundamentally misplaced. Because what strikes me from your book and everything else that I read on this period, is that Lumumba was a singularly incompetent politician, that everybody who worked with him came to hate him, mm. even members of his own political party. They were, but they're, they're the exception of Antoine Gizenga. But somebody like Albert Colangi ends up as one of his greatest enemies. Uh, and he is singularly... <coughs> ill-informed and incapable of dealing with the Belgians, of dealing with the UN, of dealing with the United States. Uh, and I suspect that you know, if he had survived, we were, he would now be a non-entity. In a sense, his reputation was made uh, by being murdered in 1961. That's, that's the first point. The second point is the guy you don't talk about is Andrew Cordier. Oh, wow. who seems to me the key figure. Uh, and if you were looking for an interface between the UN and the US, it's Cordia. Do you think Cordia exceeded Hammarskjöld's orders or instructions when he was there in September? Uh, and did he perhaps uh, go too far? Because by October as you point out in the book, the UN is actually perfectly willing to contemplate the rehabilitation of Lumumba and his reincorporation, possibly as prime minister again. So uh, what the UN does in the first two weeks of September doesn't correlate to what the UN is doing in October or November. Uh, and I'm wondering, did Cordia go too far? So there are two questions. Yes. Okay. Gee, these are great questions, and I'm, I'm going to have a long answer, because I, I, some of you might not know all of the, the references. First of all, 
in um, September when the UN, as I say, is instrumental in the overthrow of Lumumba, uh, the guy who was in the Congo uh, as uh, Hammer School's representative is Andrew Courier. And we do pay a lot of attention to him. There's even a thuggish picture of him in the book. So I, I take exception. No, but, 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 but he does not, I would say, he does not exceed his orders. He is an instrument of Hammer's cold. Over and over again, you see this guy uh, doing what uh, a good number two does, which is really to be obedient to Hammer's cold. Hammer's cold is the guy who wants Cordier out. That's clear. Uh, Hammer's cold will, will try to cover it up. Uh, such, uh, you know, his monumental. Be, as I said, it's beyond hypocrisy, but his monumental blindness to anything except what he thought of as his own Christ-like aspirations is, <laughs> is really extraordinary. What happens to change the dynamic is that Cordier leaves and Radishwal Dayal, the Indian diplomat, comes into the Congo as uh, Hammerskull's chief representative. And Dial is really out of sync a little with the, uh, with the uh, priorities of the UN. And he pushes uh, his own priorities onto the UN. Uh, he's not entirely, uh, he does get, uh, I'd say, Dial. So Dial is the, is the key change there. And he does get some support from Hammerskull because by that time, Hammerskull is scared of what he's done. He knows he's screwed up the, the Congo. And he also doesn't want to get caught himself as being the guy who did it. So he goes along with Dio. Uh, so that, that's what I think happens in that shifting period of September and October with the UN. Um, Lumumba. He is an extra. I, I don't, basically, I think you exaggerated in in the point you were making uh, about his uh, inabilities as a politician. Um, <clears throat> I don't disagree with you. In fact, we have a page or so saying, what if we don't think, you know, what made, what made him the guy he was was his, his untimely death, just as, as Kennedy's assassination made him the figure he is today. Uh, at the same time, while he was uh, a lousy politician in terms of alienating most of the people he dealt with, uh, he is an extraordinary man. Uh, the, the speeches he can give in French, uh, you know, the, the speeches which generate his leadership roles are really just really extraordinary and admirable in every way. Um, at the same time, um, and a lot of you won't like this analogy, he reminds me a lot of Benjamin Netanyahu. You know, here's a guy in a language that is not his own, uh, can do a stem-winding kind of speech. He also, Netanyahu, alienates everybody that he deals with. He's a terrible politician in some sense, but he's anchored in a more stable uh, national situation, which allows him to uh, to function well. But I think basically your notion that Lumumba couldn't get along with very many people at all, and certainly not with the Western nations, is true. Except I would take issue with your mentioning of Al uh, Albert Kalanji, uh, who was uh, for a very short time uh, an ally of uh, of Lumumba's. He was an, a much more an extremist, I think. Uh, Take someone like Casavubu, uh, uh, who is a much more moderate guy, whom Lumumba couldn't get along with. That's a much better example. Uh, I'm sorry to go on in such a long way. Let, let me just slip in a follow-up there. For those who are not uh, Congo history specialists, could you place Lumumba into the larger historiography? I mean, yours is, this, the wonderful speeches notwithstanding, yours is a very critical portrait. Um, that comes out uh, in these pages, uh, and you've, you've noted that that your picture may be somewhat at odds with with others. Could you place that in the historiographical framework? Um, yeah, I think. Well, I'm not an Africanist. I, 
tried to do this project in international history, which has cost me my late middle age, I must say. <laughs> uh, and so I don't know if I can do this okay. quite well, Eric, but it seems to me Lumumba, if you look at all of the uh, African leaders in the colonial, uh, the late colonial and post-colonial period, almost all of them have been tainted by charges of corruption, neo-colonialism, generalized thuggery. Uh, very, very few of them uh, that you can mention have escaped uh, really uh, a very, very uh, critical historical appraisal of what they've done. Lumumba is the one guy who has been considered heroic in that the standard line goes, if only he had lived, not only with the course of the Congo, his history been different, but indeed all of African history might have been different. He represents this idealistic strand in leadership which was, was cut off uh, by the West in the way it was. Uh, and, there, that's why, uh, and I understand why people say this, because he was such an extraordinarily intelligent and charismatic figure. I mean, Gerard and I uh, have listened to, have seen all of the news clips of Lumumba, all the pictures, we've listened to the speeches, and my French is terrible, but I listened to that. He gave this extraordinary speech on Independence Day when he says to Baldwin, <laughs> and it's abs, yeah, that's right. Who's the guy back there? I mean, it is spectacular. And what's interesting, this speech is very, very, the speech, it's called the speech. What's interesting about it, if you see all the different news clips and everything, he gives that, he gives that speech, and all the blacks, a lot of whom were there, are his enemies. They stand up and clap and cheer. Because this is the one guy who can tell uh, the colonial oppressor, I'm not taking it anymore. And there is something compelling about that, which is why I don't want to go along entirely with your view that, you know, he would have lost out anyway, although in my heart of hearts, I think that's true. Can I ask you just to uh, elaborate a little more on another prominent personality, what you said about Hammerskold is very interesting. I grant that there's a real politic to him all the way, but could you tell us a little bit more about his original plan, how it went astray, and what he was really up to in the end? And while we're at it, whether there's anything to the present theory that there was something about the crash of the airplane that remains controversial. All right, two parts. First, what did Hammerskold want to do in the Congo? His idea is that um, the Congo will rise up to ha hold an independent and responsible and respectable place among the newly African, uh, newly independent African nations. But according to him, they're not going to be able to do it on their own. They have to have tutelage from the West. And who's going to give them that ser series of tutorials? The UN. Uh, at heart, I think what, what Hammerskoll is about once that uh, peacekeeping operation is engaged in is to make his organization, the UN, a real player in international politics. So he's going to take the Congo, he's going to lead it, he's going to shape its policies on behalf of the Africans who don't really know what they're doing themselves. Uh, and in order to accomplish that goal, he's got to do something about this guy Lumumba, because Lumumba doesn't listen to him. Uh, so I think what really is driving uh, Hammer's goal is an attempt to put his own institution into the positive limelight. That's, that's the main thing. Now, this doesn't make him a hero for everyone, and one, if I actually think the most, although wrong, the most compelling uh, analysis of what Hammerskull was about <laughs> and who his enemies are uh, is given in uh, Connor Cruz O'Brien's play, Murderous Angels, which I think it's a, this is a play about the Congo, <coughs> written by Connor Cruz O'Brien, who is 
on par with Lumumba in terms of his uh, eloquence and analytic ability. Uh, and in the play, uh, O'Brien argues basically that it's uh, Katangan or Belgian right-wingers who conspire to bring the uh, Hammerskold's plane down in 19, at the end of 1961 when he's killed in this mysterious crash which the UN is even as we speak investigating. It's possible. Uh, I'm not very much a fan of conspiracy theories and I look at a lot of them and never find any of them compelling. Uh, the people who have written about this particular plane crash and trying to figure out whether uh, it was part of some you know, plot to murder him. Um, I wish I could, there, there, there's a lot of, you know, the, the, a lot of research has been done. Uh, I'm suspicious of the sanity of the people who have written about, about it. It's possible, uh, but I'm not convinced that uh, it was anything but a plane crash. Gentleman against the door there. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Yaya Fanusi. I was 17 years old when Lumumba was assassinated. You were what? I was 17 years old ah. when Lumumba was assassinated. I feel upset that the gentleman here characterized Lumumba the way he did. You see, white folk like you who don't no, listen. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Listen, listen. Hold on. Listen, listen. When you have nationalist, a people as a leader who is working in the interest of its people, it's very difficult to get along with your own people who are either short-sighted, confused, or downright stupid. That's what Lumumba faced. He was an African nationalist, and we all are for him. And there will be a United States of Africa 2017 project, and we'll make sure we to punish those who killed him. To respond. We do not. <laughs> right, um, right there in the back, and then we'll move our way up here. Okay. Hi. Uh, sorry, I don't have any incendiary remarks to make, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. I was in the negative integers when uh, Patrice Lumumba died, so but my folks were. Um, what uh, What do you guys say to the uh, to the claim, I suppose, uh, by the UN to have intelligence, Western intelligence agencies, specifically uh, two in the United States, to release documents relating to um, Dr. Hammer Schultz's uh, death. Thanks. Um, do I think that the, that the United States ought to reveal, <coughs> ought to release those well, documents? What's your assessment of, of the request by the UN for the release of documents by those agencies? I mean, certainly the people at that level, the UN, are not as you characterized some of the people who have an interest in it to be? Uh, I don't know if they do now. Uh, look, I'm a historian. I think the more documents we can get, the better off. I would like it better if the United States responded to my FOIA, my FOIA request. <laughs> of course, I, of course you want these documents released. Of course you want to know what's going on. <laughs> Well, it could be that the UN documents will be very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the problem with the UN documents, by the way, you could probably find them. The UN has a huge unorganized archive on its work in the Congo in the early 1960s. Uh, I spent a year up in New York trying to figure out what's going on. They don't know what they have. They've got stuff that's still classified, which you can get. Uh, it's not so much a matter of whether they'll release the documents or not, but if they could find them. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, Dr. Falahi, <clears throat> uh, let me respond to the gentleman who described uh, Mumba as uh, a competent thing. You know. I would suggest to you to go and read the uh, uh, King Leopold Ghost. Uh, that was, uh, Child. When you finish reading that book, perhaps you have a change of heart. No, I don't think so. Like you will. You will. Because if you read that book, the brutalization, the oppression, on the margin. Of fact, the book describes this as, as a, a, the worst crime in humanity, the worst crime in, 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 in human history. 
<laughs> so to go back to your to your to your presentation, you said that you know those you mentioned three elements: UN, US, Belgium, and the anti Lumumba. What about the Africans? They are pretty much supportive of. Uh, you mean, you mean Africans, Africans outside yes. the Congo? Africans outside the Congo. I could remember that Ghana had sent yes. troops to yes. Congo at that time. Yes. What was the role of Ghana? Was he marginalized? Was he allowed to perform? Was he supposed to perform? Good question. Very good question. Uh, I think in general, uh, the bulk of the Afro-Asian bloc is loves Lumumba, but there are uh, you know a large number of African countries which, for various reasons, uh, are aligned with the West and don't like Lumumba. Ghana itself is a very interesting case. Ghana is an ex-British uh, colony. Yes. Uh, its military at that time is run by a British general, and that British general is the leader of the Ghanaian. Uh, UN force, the peacekeeping force. Uh, Ghana under uh, Nkrumah is a very close ally of Lumumba. Yes. The peacekeepers uh, they, from Ghana, when they go into Ghana, uh, or when they go into the Congo, generally support Lumumba, but not all the time. Uh, they, one reason is they have this British general who's commanding them. I mean, it's Right, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. There is one time when, uh, when they finally arrest Lumumba, uh, uh, when he's trying to escape to Stanley, uh, what was then Stanleyville, uh, where from what I can see with the documents, the Ghanaian soldiers do not uh, act to rescue him. Hmm. They What they do is let, let the... Uh, other guys beat Lumumba. They, they prevent the other people from beating Lumumba up, and then they let. Then they allow the other people to take him away. So all of these things, and this is what I would say to the guy in the the, the green shirt. These are very very complicated problems. I mean, when you look at uh, who's doing what and uh, who's responsible for what, it's not always very clear. And there were Africans who were opposed to Lumumba. And it wasn't that they were just stupid or confused. They had their own ideas about the governance of this huge chunk of territory in the center of the country. Uh, and as a historian, I have to respect their voices as well as the clarion voice, which I love, of Patrice Lumumba. And then we'll work the mic around the room. Thank you so much for your talk today. My name is Lauren Sinclair, and I have a question about your research process. I was wondering, um, I also do historical research, and I'm curious about the sources that you wanted to use, especially since this is a topic that's been written about so much. Um, was there anything that you think gave your research an edge? Or I think it was last year, Fruce um, released the new uh, Congo resources. Was that helpful in your process? Thank you. Another good question. Um, I'm an American historian. Doing this transnational or Atlantic or whatever, the, New international history for me was uh, a difficult process. This book took 12 years to write. Uh, I think to the extent that there we uh, did something different uh, is that uh, I'd like to tell you we found new troves of documents that no one had ever seen. And believe me, we worked our butts off going all over, finding everything we could. In truth, the evidentiary, evidentiary basis for the study of this affair is pretty well established. We found some stuff, but not an enormous, uh, you know, a huge amount. What I think is really interesting for us about the book is that we systematically compared the UN materials to the Belgian materials to the American materials to the African materials. And that was what I found so interesting about doing transnational history is that you really do have to master 
the scholarship and the documentations. And uh, across these uh, national and international boundaries, if that's how you would describe the, uh, the United Nations. So that's what, in terms of research and our method,